Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just want to thank our Father for the first two speakers, for Prophet Diane Randall and Prophet Janie Lewis. We just thank him so much for that. Um, and there's going to be an intersection of a similar, um, a similar word that uh, Prophet Janie spoke that uh, I'm going to uh, repeat, but in a different way, okay? So, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. I'm purposely giving the Holy Spirit the opportunity to move the opportunity to breathe upon what already has been spoken, the opportunity to cause it to go deep in your spirit. The word and the spirit go together. Holy Spirit, we thank you that the Father ordained for this conference. He had a specific purpose in mind that he wanted to restore in each and every one of his daughters and sons a new level of faith. But the faith is not just faith. It's faith in the prophetic promises of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for a move of the spirit to seal the words because when the word is preached, the enemy comes to try to take the word. But Father, we declare there is a divine sealing of the words that are being released today, that they will reside deeply in our inner man. And that Father, a special gifting a faith is going to be ignited today. That is your prophetic promise to me when you gave this conference. You said, I want to impart another level of faith in their lives, that they'll be able to walk with me, that they'll be able to fulfill what I've called them to do in the midst of adversity, in the midst of negativity, in the midst of haters, in the midst of naysayers, in the midst of contrary circumstances, that they will have such a faith that will rise up in them and say, no, I know what my father said. And I am not gonna bow. I am not bowing because an adverse wind has come. Father, we pray for divine sealing. God, I ask for the release of angels to be released, to begin to minister over every person that is here a spirit that will cause you to rule in the midst of your enemies your enemies are going to come god's not going to remove them he's going to cause you to rule in the midst of them be extended hey we serve a great God. There is nothing greater than him. Jesus has been given a name that is above every yes. other name. Yes. Ooh. And we magnify him on today. Yes. We give you thanks for this conference. We give you thanks for the words that have gone ahead. We give you thanks for the prophetic promises. Hey, and it's our job to receive. And so I want you to say in your own way that God, I receive everything that you 
have destined for me to receive in this conference. Some of it is not going to manifest to years down the line. But the seed has been sown in good ground, and it shall bring forth. Thus says the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to give the Holy Spirit room. This is his conference. Hey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We honor you, Father. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you. Hallelujah. 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 Restoring faith in the prophetic promises of Jesus Christ. I think I haven't said this. This is a combined effort between Kingdom Women of Divine Purpose and Destiny, Hannah's Healing House, and the King's Court, joining together to have a synergy in the realm of the spirit. And so one of the things that we have to know that our level of faith in the prophetic promises of Jesus Christ has a direct relationship upon our walk with him and our interaction with the Holy Spirit. If we do not have faith to believe what God has said and his ability to perform or come through on what he has said, we will end up with a religious form. We'll have a form of godliness that denies the power of God to fully live out what he has called us to do. So many people are in churches with religious form. They have no relationship with the Holy Spirit. They have no relationship. They can't even say what God says. It was Patha said. What Patha told me and Patha. So when we stand before God, God is not going to judge us on what Patha said. Not on what bishop, apostle, prophet. He's going to judge us on what he has said to us. And we've got to recognize that. It's not about ministry. It's about him, our relationship with him. And God desires to have relationship that is rooted in his son. Because some have relationships rooted in religion, rooted in traditions, rooted in idolatry of men. But your relationship has to be re related, rooted in Christ. Because as a prophet Janie said, all of the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yea and amen. And this is a very important point, and I'm so happy she brought that up. If you believe that the promises of a God are sometimes or maybe, you can't walk straight. If you believe he might come through or he's sitting somewhere deciding if he's going to come through, you will have a crooked walk because you will have no stability undergirding you to say, I can walk this thing through on the confidence of who God says he is, not me. By two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. When he couldn't swear by anything else, he swore by himself. And ladies, we've got to get this. God is not a man that he should lie. We know pastors even lie. Prophets lie. Prophet lie. Ministers lie. But God never lies. And one of the things we have got to get in us to be restored back to the place he wants us to be is to know that his word is infallible. 
So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return into me void. So sometimes we pray, well, God, I don't know if you're hearing this. I don't know if this is hidden or missing. So why are you praying? Why are you praying? If you don't believe that God is going to answer your prayer, why waste your time? The word of God tells us this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, then we know. And we got to walk in a knowing. Then we know that we're going to have the promises or the word that is ordained by him. We've got to get that his promises are yea and amen. It is that maybe he will or maybe he won't yo-yo cycle that has to be broken in our lives. Like the Hebrew boys, they said, we're not bowing to you. God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing to you. And that's what we've got to get in our spirit, that we're not bowing whether God, we know God can show up. We're anticipating that he's showing up. We're expecting that he's showing up. But even if he doesn't, we're not bowing. Because this is just like if you're old enough when they used to play the dozens, they say your mama And Satan just says, yo, daddy, he not going to come through for you. He's always whispering that in our ears. And if you're agreeing with him, how are you going to stand? You got to stand knowing he's going to come through. So we need to be so firmly convinced of God's ability to fulfill his promises that we die believing them. That we never give up. Never give up. Hebrews 11, 13, amplify. All these died in faith, guided and sustained by it. So faith guides us. Faith sustains us. It is a force that causes us to be strong, to go through, to overcome, because we believe in the ability of our God. Says without receiving the tangible fulfillment of God's promise. Just like Prophet Janie, I'm believing Hannah's house. I don't have the tangible fulfillment, but I have the faith to believe because God promised that He is not a man that He should lie. It says, only having seen, anticipated them, and having welcomed them from a distance. And I love this in the Passion. They all live their lives on earth as those who belong to another realm. We got to live our lives like we belong to another realm because we do. And that realm is called the kingdom of God. So our hope is not on everything in this earth. Our hope is in God's kingdom. The Holy Spirit is the administrator of that kingdom. And that is why we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is not rewriting your story. Your story is already written. Jesus said, lo, in the volume of the book, it's written of me to do your will. It's some really cute songs. When I get to that part, I just part, pause because that's not true. God's not rewriting your story. God wrote your story. You're the one who's coming in alignment to where he is. So sometimes we're a little bit slow getting on the same page with God, but the story's already written. We're coming into agreement with the story. They saw the spiritual kingdom realm of God. They did not live for what they received on earth. And we have to seek first the kingdom of God and know God will provide all those other things that we need to live. Second Corinthians first 19 to 20, which was quoted by prophet Janie, which I'm going to look at it in the new living translation. It says for Jesus Christ, 
the son of God does not waver between yes and no. So we got some teeter-totterers in here. Yes, we got no, we got yes, we got no, we got soon you're going to get dizzy. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, not just in the way he's seeking, in all of them. So we've got to begin to stop teeter-tottering between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you as God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And it is through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. So when we say yes to his yes, it ascends. It opens up the realms of heaven to us. So I agree with you, God, and that yes ascends and opens up worship, opens up glory, opens up the doors of heaven. One of the footnotes to this scripture in the Passion Translation gives us two additional thoughts, that it is through Christ that we hear and believe God's promises and say the declaration of our faith, amen, or that it is Christ himself who is speaking through us the amen. I want you to picture that because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. So when we come into agreement with the promises of God, that hope actually speaks to the promise. They come into agreement with each other. That's why when we have our relationship knitted with Christ, yes, difficulties are going to come, but we will overcome. Because the yes in us will agree with the yes in heaven. And if two should agree as touching anything that they ask the Father, it's going to be given to them. So our yes has to stay consistent. When the boat is rocking, it's still a yes. When it looks like I'm getting ready to sink, it's still a yes. When it looks like I'm almost in the water, it's still a yes. The yes has to stay. And even if you go down, it's still a yes to his promises. So it is the promised Holy Spirit who takes from Christ and gives to us. That's why we have to have relationship with the Holy Spirit, because he's always taking from Christ and giving to us. So either way, fulfillment of all of God's prophetic promises to us are fulfilled through Christ and require faith in him. Not, not faith in your denomination, not faith in headquarters, not hate, faith in bishop. Because if you truly have relationship with God, unless you're in a ministry that truly has relationship with God, there is going to be a conflict. There's going to be a clash at some point in time. So we've got to honor God over everything else. And this is really interesting. All of the promises are fulfilled through Christ. And he has some wonderful promises. Second Peter 1, 4, he promised to enable us to share of his divine nature and to escape from the world. He promised that tell us God's plans in Jeremiah 29, 11. They're plans of good to give you a future and a hope, not disaster. In Matthew 11, 28 to 29, he promised to give us rest. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me. We got to have a relationship with Christ. Don't wear out Prophet Janie. Don't come to Prophet Janie. Come to Jesus. Because while you're praying, if God wants Prophet Janie to say something to you, he can tell Prophet Jamie. 
Isaiah 40, 29 to 31, he promised to give power to the weak and strength to the powerless. So when you're weak, go to Jesus. He promised to supply our needs. When you're running dry, go to Jesus. Philippians 419 and Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. In Romans 8, 37 to 39, one of the greatest promises, he promised the inseparable power between him and you that nothing can separate me from the love of God. But where is it? In Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so we've got to get in him. Christ cannot be eliminated from the fulfillment of the promises. And that's what's happening today. Many churches have eliminated Christ out of the, the formula. 10 steps to this, 20 steps to that. You just do a dance. 10, hey, you just start dancing. And you just have all these steps that are man-made that do not bring Christ or the Holy Spirit into them. And we've got to watch it, people, Black people. I'm talking to you. Black people. We got to watch the ideologies that are telling us to hate people because they're white. God is love. Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't take the bait. But we were slaves. Were you a slave? Were you working back there? So do you deserve all of this that you're asking for? Were you even related to the slaves that worked? You don't even know that. But these ideologies are saying, hate them. The system is white supremacy, white supremacy. I say God supremacy. Because if you have God supremacy, everything will bow. When we walk in who God calls us to walk in, we can have tolerance for the world, but the world is crazy. It's a different construct. There are two constructs, the construct of the world and the construct of the kingdom. All I'm saying is don't be swallowed up into the bait of Satan to hate people. Yes, you may be offended. All of us have probably gone through racism. But we need to go to God to get that offense out of us to be healed and to walk in love. Because all of us know some black people that have jacked us up worse than white people. <laughs> So if we're looking at the people who jacked us, it's probably gonna be more black than white. So we can't just be hating on white people saying they, they messed it up. I assure you that if we get on the page with God, nothing shall be impossible to us. Not white, not black, not Arab, not whatever. God will make room for our gifts. God will promote us. Promotion comes from God. And so we're not, we're not gonna go into those ideologies. Christ desires individual relationship with us, but we can't follow that pattern from Mount Sinai. They told Moses, you go up, we're gonna stay down here. But they were actually setting him up. They wanted to see if God was gonna destroy him. So you go up for us, and then you tell us what he says, and we'll do what you, you tell us. But we know they didn't do that. So we can't hide behind our leaders. We've got to go to him individually. Even with Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were first close to God. But as they began to separate from him, the enemy was able to come in. We got to watch people who bring the enemy's DNA. Don't let them come in. And their, their DNA shows. They try to slip little things. You say, oh, that's serpentine. When you see the movement of a snake, know that a snake is behind. Don't start petting the snake. You better tread on the snake in prayer. Deception always reveals the true 
source of anything. If you wait on something, you will know whether it's true or sent from Satan. So when we turn down our level of prayer, worship, and word, the influence of the influences of the world become stronger and weaken our faith. So what happens to us when life begins to choke out of the, the word of God out of us? And I really want you to be honest about this. And Prophet Diane brought this up. Where are you in your faith? Where are you? Do you still really believe God? Or do you say, why didn't God stop COVID? Well, COVID is man-made. But anyway, why didn't God stop COVID? Because God gave the governance of the earth to man. It's a spiritual principle. The governance of the earth was given to men. God respects the governance that he gave to man. We as the church are supposed to be the legislative assembly that binds and looses on the earth. But the church has stopped praying. The church has to come back and take its position of governance over the earth. God called us to bind and to loose in prayer, but we've stopped doing that. Now everybody's running after the prophet with the most fanaticism, the most flamboyant. I mean, can you believe in South Africa, people are drinking fuel that you put in a car saying they're going to get anointed? No, you're going to get death. You don't have to remove your common sense. So what happens when new ideologies, philosophies, and social, social platforms run directly counter to God's word? What are you going to do? You're going to have to choose whose report am I going to believe, God's or what the world is saying. That is why this theme came. That is why God wanted this conference, because he wanted you to evaluate where you are in the faith. Because if you don't know, this whole COVID thing is just a test run of the mark of the beast. It's a test run to see how you're going to respond, to see whether you're going to be in faith, to see whether you're going to be taken over by fear. The church has got to rise up. We cannot be taken over by fear. We cannot, God did not give us a spirit of fear. We've got to begin to pray. We've got to begin to prophesy his promises. We've got to begin to have faith in them. God is asking for a response from your heart. And restore just means to bring someone or something back to a former condition, place, or position. It means to bring a law, a tradition, a way of working back into use. So if your faith has not been working, God is saying, I ordained this conference to put a check in you to get your faith back to working. We've got to have our faith working. It is to give something that was lost or stolen back. God wants to renew, restore, give back. And we can repent, and that was from the Oxford Dictionary. Restoring its biblical meaning uh, usually means giving back more. When God restores, he always gives back more. He doesn't just give back the little, he gives back more. So God is the originator of the build back better. Because he always builds back better. And so we've got to know that. And as Prophet Janie said, if we make a mistake, get back up. Let God restore you. God wants to build, but he's asking for co-laborers. We've got to decide today that, God, I'm a co-laborer with you. Yes. I'm really going to walk this thing. It's not about hooping and hollering in a service and then going back out and doing what you were doing. God sees you. We don't have to see you. God sees you. God wants a difference made today that you really consider the commitment you have for him. Because we need young people who are gonna minister to young people. Most young people don't listen to older people. 
this generation, millennials, Gen Z, they just don't listen to older people. But God's going to raise up, and I declare that, out of the generation of young people, he's going to raise up a generation of remnant believers who have a heart to serve him, who have a heart to know truth, to have a heart to magnify him. Women, and this was so funny to me. I wasn't going to put it in there, but I wanted to say this. Black women especially know how to set it out for a man. When you want him, you go to all lengths. You got the weave, you got the lashes, you got the boobs, you got the butt, you got your clothes. You set it out for that man. Well, God said, I want you to set out your life for me. Set out your life for me. Because it's about commitment. When a woman wants a man, she does everything to get him. So when you want God, are you willing to do everything to have him? The teaching has been so bad that a magic wand just comes over you and you have to do nothing. But we have to do something. Just like in a love relationship with a man, a love relationship with God requires some sacrifice of our time. We got to read his word as a love note to us, as a love song. Worship him with a love melody. That's how relationship grows, just like it does in the natural. It will always require the element of faith. And uh, Prophet Janie went into this. I like verse 3 in Hebrews 11.3. It says, by faith, that is an inherent trust, an enduring confidence in the power, wisdom, and goodness of God. So when you say I'm in faith, it says that you're saying I have inherent trust. I have an enduring confidence in his power. I have an enduring confidence in his wisdom and his goodness. So many people think God is bad, that he wants to just do something bad if you don't dot the I and cross the T, but that's not true. That's not his nature. But faith is something, is a conviction of the reality of what is in the spirit realm as if it is a reality, even when it's not in the physical realm. And God wants us to move to that realm of believing him again and walking with confidence in him again. And this is the number one, without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please him because whoever comes to him has to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. Let's be honest, how many of you say, I did all of that for God, he didn't give me none. But look at Sister Bozo, who didn't even do anything for him. And she got her Mercedes. She got her house. She got her man. But I was slaving for you, God. I was slaving for you, God. Where my reward? A lot of people think that in their heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Your actions show that that's what you believe about God. And so today we need to correct that. There is always something that one person is going to do more than the other. Because God apportions faith according to your calling, according to what he has for you to do. So don't compare yourself. The word of God said that's unwise. Don't compare yourself to Sister Sue. Just you do what God called you to do. We don't even think that when we get to heaven, everybody gets the same thing, because they don't. They'll all be in heaven, but maybe some will be in heaven slums, barely making it in. Because some people say, I just want to get in. I, don't, I just want to get in. You can put me in the boondocks of heaven. I don't care, just as long as I'm in. According to your own words. That's what you're getting. And then some people 
honor God and esteem him highly. And they live their life in that manner. So if God is just, is he going to give to the one who honors and esteems him the exact same thing that someone says, I just barely want to make it in? Okay. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 1 John 5, 3 to 5 says, true love for God means obeying his command. Don't say you love God, but you won't do what he says. You got to do what he says to show that you love him. It says that every child of God overcomes the world by their faith. So if your faith is gone, how are you going to overpower the world? You got to operate in faith. It's an operational system. Just like on your computer, Windows 10. This is faith 10. And faith keeps going from another upgrade to another upgrade. And God is upgrading our faith today. Another operating system. We even can have a mustard seed seeds of faith. And Prophet Jenny mentioned that. Mustard seed faith moves mountains. Can you imagine what full faith does? Mustard seed. He answered, because of your little faith, your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God, for I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have living faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And if it is God's will, it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. God has apportioned every single one of us a measure of faith, Romans 12, 3. As God has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designated for service. In 1 Corinthians 12, 9, the passage says, and to another one, the same spirit gives the gift of faith. To another, wonder-working faith is given by the same Holy Spirit. So we're just going to end this session with prayer. So I want you to stand. I want you to shake yourself. I want you to begin to ignite your heart for God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just stir up, Lord, our faith, God. You've given all of us a measure of faith. And God, even if that faith is the size of a mustard seed, you said that it would move mountains. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just as you divided yourself amongst everyone who was in the upper room, we ask for you to come and to release a new measure of faith. Come, let the angels of the Lord come and just fan the flames in this room. Begin to create an atmosphere that is conducive for you to move, that we will receive a new measure of faith, God. It's not about anybody laying hands. It's about your presence, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, we yield. We yield. We yield. We yield to you, God. We yield to you. We yield our mind, our will. We yield our emotions. We yield our soul. We yield our very being. We yield. Hey. We yield. We yield. We yield. We yield. We yield. We receive. We receive a divine impartation. Father, you know everyone who is here. You know their names. Your name is, their name is written on the palm of your hands. You know where they live. You know their gifts and callings. Oh, Father, we ask for a divine impartation. Oh, God, Holy Spirit. We just, everyone, I just want you to open yourself up to receive from the Holy Spirit. Receive from the Holy Spirit. Receive.
We're going to do personal ministry after lunch. But we see, we've got to learn to teach ourselves how to be quiet and to position ourselves to receive from the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. we receive from you. Holy Spirit, begin to pierce through the layers of our soul. So much, so many things are layered in our soul. Trauma is layered there. Holy Spirit, begin to heal, to go deep into our souls, to begin to heal. Childhood hurts, uh, hurts in our adult life. Begin to go in, Holy Spirit. We honor you. Lord, we're not going to raise up an allegiance to man. We acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just thank you, Holy Spirit. We acknowledge you, Holy Spirit. We worship you, Holy Spirit. We adore you, Holy Spirit. Father, we just begin to ask you. I want you to stay in that mode for about two more minutes. <laughs> 